Hello and welcome to our Music Ministry Sunday, presented to you by Tab Music. Tab Music is the name of the Willing Hall Tabernacle Music Ministry Team. Our mandate is to create the atmosphere for divine worship with excellence in delivery, sharing our gifts at the highest level through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Today we will look back on moments of worship we have shared, engage in praise and worship together, and talk about the importance and the power of praise and worship in our lives. The late Miles Monroe wrote a book entitled The Purpose and Power of Praise and Worship. In the book he mentions that praise is celebrating God as our heart's true home. The scriptures are filled with injunctions to praise the Lord, such as 1 Chronicles 29 verse 20, and David said to all the congregation, now bless the Lord your God. And all the congregation blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshiped the Lord and the King. Or Psalms 106 verse one, Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Or Psalms 150 verse 6, which we do quote often. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise he the Lord. In Mars Monroe's book, he refers to eight principles of praise. The first, to praise means to commend to approve, to give a favourable judgement, to glorify and to esteem. Praising God by commendation means that we entrust our lives to his care and recommend that others do the same. Praising God by approval means that we have a favourable opinion of God which we tell him and others. Praising by giving God glory means that we honour him and express our admiration for him. Praise turns the focus of our life from us to God. Before we can consistently praise God, we must get close enough to him to see his true nature and character. Praise is a conscious choice, an act of our will. And finally, a sacrifice of praise is the praise we give God from obedience despite how we feel. So let's engage in praise right now. Psalms 34 verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. And verse 3, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together.
what do you, what do all the signals mean that singers use and why do they use them? So I'll only give you three. So one would be this, which means singing unison, one harmony, everybody singing in the same harmony all together. And I use this so they know what they're doing. And I usually do the signal behind my back. So if you see me put my hand behind my back, I'll be throwing probably this signal or the next signal, which would be this, which means three part harmony, soprano, alto, tenor, high, medium, low, and we just use this to make them sound sweeter. And why else do we use them, Demille? Um Harmonies are made out of chords. So that, so that if the keyboards or guitarists, if there's one, and um, whatever they play, you would, you would add to the harmonies what they're singing. Yeah, so we add more variation, more color, and, and it would make it more brighter. Yeah. yeah. And we also use this which means to invert not on the phone none of that it means to invert so all the harmony shift so tenor will move to alto alto will move to soprano and soprano will move to high tenor and we use that because one yes it does sound nice but two we can also shift the atmosphere so we could be singing a worship song and then i could call this and as soon as we shift, our harmony shift, the atmosphere can shift also. Yeah, so the next question is, um, what signals do singers use to the, music, to the musicians and what, and what do they mean? So to the musicians, we use this. Which means to the top. We use this. Which means um, like to the bridge or, or to the next part. This. Leap or turn around, and this brings it down. <laughs> okay, next question: What do the numbers mean that musicians shout or show to each other in the middle of songs? So basically, the num the number system is um it's basically a major scale. So, for example, if you see the one, the one would be C, the two, the two would be D, the three would be E, the four would be F and then the G would be five and then so on. Yeah, so um, the reason why we use them is easy to communicate instead of using notes and just easy to get across. Mm -hmm. it, it's, instead of just explaining like what note it is or, or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. Okay, next question is, if musicians have rehearsed, why do you need to call numbers? The reason why we call numbers, as I said before, it's easier to, 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 to communicate. Also, um, another reason why we use numbers, like depending on flow and feel, and also depending on the, um, on the um, what's the word? And mm -hmm. on, on the flow of the service, mm -hmm. of the word is. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so it's easy to communicate, easy, easy to get across and plus if the atmosphere has shifted <laughs> different numbers can be used yeah even though i don't know what the numbers mean but yeah we all we're all learning something new today aren't we so yeah <laughs> yeah that's it
Hello everybody and welcome. I'm going to be sharing this morning's message with you. Yes, it's very quiet here today. Um, you can even hear my echo. Um, it's just me. Um, but you know what? Um, we need to keep things moving in these strange times. Um, things may or may not get back to um, how we used to know them. But one thing that is true is that we still have work to do. Um, the gospel message will only bear fruit if it is sown by, um, by us. Um, and for now, let's adapt and keep things moving forward, as I said. But listen, let's get on today's, to um, today's message. So I'm Darren Letman, and I'm the Worship and Music Ministry Director here at Woodenor Tabernacle. And we're going to have a talk about a few aspects of worship. So is corporate worship essential? Is the music important? Why do us musicians keep playing when songs finish? And why is Darren speaking today? Why aren't I doing something technical with the microphones or something different? Let's try and answer just some of those questions. Okay, so we're not going to just talk about worship today. 
we're going to also look at crossover. So crossing over into that deeper relationship and understanding and um, with Christ. And we're going to try and understand some ways and some things that we can do to, to achieve that. Okay. And then finally, we're going to be looking at your context and, and does your context um, need to be um, um, decisive? Okay, let's, um, let's move on. Okay, so we'll be looking at... So the text we'll be looking at is um, Genesis 22. So, so it's, it's so easy, easy when we start talking about worship to get caught in all the noise and the wrong, and the wrong things. But let me try and bring to the fore just some of the, some of the important things. So as worship leaders, we are called to silence the noise of life so we can share the songs of the Lord. But worship is more than just songs. Okay, so if we get into it now, so if we look at Genesis 22, this is where we hear the word worship mentioned for the very first time. Genesis 20, 22 is a very well-known story of Abraham and his son Isaac. So it all starts in verse 1. Okay, so verse 1 talks about um, where, where God calls out to Abraham and, he say, um, and Abraham answers and says, Here I am. So here I am is significant in the fact that he could have just answered and said, hello, or yes, but by saying, here I am, um, I think there's a, there's a Hebrew, tra Hebrew translation for Hineni, Hineni, and it says, Lord, before you ask, my answer is yes. So, okay, let's keep moving on. So, then God said, take your only son, your only son who you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Okay, so early the next morning, he got his gear together and saddled his donkey and took two of his servants to where God had told him to go. Okay, so let's take this back. Um, so without question, Abram got up in preparation to sacrifice his only son. This was, this was faith, but we're going to see more of um, Abraham's faith as we move through the um, next few verses. Okay, and when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he took the wood and the knife and went off to the place that God had told him about. Okay, so in verse four, it talks about on the third day, he saw the place that God had told him about. But listen, in verse five, um, which is very important, and, and, the, and verse five showed how much of a man um, of faith Abraham was. He said to his, his, his servants who were there at the place, he said, stay here while we worship and we will come back to you. So I remember, Abram had just told, been told by God to sacrifice his son, but his faith was, at, was, was, was such that he said, we will come back to you. Okay, so, so Abraham and his son picked up the knife and the firewood, and they went off to the place that God had, had told them to go to. And while they were walking, Isaac, Isaac, Abraham's son, asked, not knowing, Father, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? That was a bit of an awkward question at the time, but Abraham answered and said, God himself will provide a sacrifice for the offering. Okay, and then the two of them went on together um, to the place that God had told them to go to. And when he reached, the, reached that place, he, started, and, um, he saw, started building the altar and he bound his son Isaac and he laid his son on top of the altar. Okay, so this being done, Abraham takes a knife and he stretches out his hand to slay his son. So here is an act of absolute faith and obedience to God. But God, by his, by his providence, calls us to part with an Isaac sometimes in our lives. Okay, so Isaacs can be many different things. And we must do it with, sub with submission to his holy will. But thankfully... Before Abraham could make the sacrifice, a ram appeared that was trapped in a thicket by his horns as a sacrifice. So, so the sacrifice appeared. God supplied the sacrifice, and God supplies the sacrifice. Um, God supplies the sacrifice to spare Abraham's son. Okay, so this is the first example of worship in the Bible in, Gen in Genesis. Okay, and it isn't until later on in the chapter when we hear about the keyboards and the drums and the singers. Well, no, I'm only joking. So there's, no, there's, there's, there's none of that. So in Genesis 22, when worship is described, there is no talk of keyboards, there's no talk of guitars, there's no talk of drums, singers, or, or whatever. So, okay. So at the place of worship described here, 
in Genesis 22, there was an altar and the treasure of somebody's heart, somebody's son, and this occurred in a place of great, great obedience and even greater, greater trust. So this example demonstrated a yielded heart, a submitted heart, a heart that was resisting nothing. So worship almost equals handing control of your heart over to God. So Abraham, Abraham had passed that test and because he hadn't held nothing back, God promised that he and his seed and his generations would be blessed. Okay, so worship isn't worship until it costs you something. The songs are not the worship. Just because we play a song, that is not the worship. I'm gonna get into, get into that now. Okay, so, so the songs help us to voice what is in our hearts to say. The songs help us to forget about what is going on in life for the moment. The songs help us to silence the noise of life that surrounds us sometimes and gives us, gives us an escape. So, so the songs are like vehicles or like the train tracks that help us get to the final destination. Although the songs are critically important, they are not the highest focus. Our highest focus is our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Okay, so who remembers that film, Trains, Planes and Automobiles? That was released in the probably in the late 80s. It, um, it featured um, John Candy and um, Steve Steve Martin. Okay, so so they had a destination to get to, but their original modes of transport transport were compromised. So they did what so they did whatever they they could to reach the destination um, for a family thanks, Thanksgiving. So so the thing about corporate worship is that although we do all the planning, all the hard work all the musical planning and it's not it's not about the nice chords and it's not about the musical the, the music, musical terms and what the guys do on stage and it's not about the guys playing the four chord at the end of the song it's not about the worship leaders hitting the vocal inversion at the right time yes all of that is critically important but what we care about most is that the note hits your heart right we care that the words that go forth hit your heart and the songs serve as a train track to, to get you to that ultimate destination, to push you in the, in the right direction, the area of focus, which is ultimately Jesus Christ. Okay, so why do music, musicians carry on playing after a song, song has finished sometime? So the worship leaders may, may disappear off stage, but sometimes the musicians carry on. So especially when there has been a move of the Holy Spirit. So if the vehicle that led the church corporately into a phase of worship was a particular song, we'll always keep playing that song to try and maintain that connection. Many times we just do not want that connection to be cut. Okay, and so, okay, let's, so let's move on a, a little bit now. So let's, let's have a, a quick chat about focus and crossing over to that, um, the, of, the, of, the other side. So, so crossing over so that you're, you're, you're able to ruthlessly eliminate distractions and you're able to silence the noise and be able to to live a yielded life to jesus christ okay so you know what this just this this just does not apply to your spiritual walk this can this can and will spill over to your professional um, and secular careers so focus is one of the things that we are 100 percent in control of okay so focus is one thing that we are 100 percent in control of What's, what are you going to focus on? Are you going to focus on the frustration of life and the things that you are still waiting on God for? Or, what God, or are you going to focus on what God has already given you? So listen, we all have a massive amount of frustrations out there, but we need to focus on what God has given us rather than what we have, what we have not got. Okay? So in Matthew 14, so, yeah, so, in Matthew, so in Matthew 14, when Peter placed his foot on the water, it was not easy. Yet, in spite of it all, he stayed focused on the Lord. And we all know that at the moment that Peter began to focus more on the elements that surrounded him, rather than God in front of him, he began to sink. So listen, don't be as distracted by the elements, nor let the naysayers divert, divert your attention. Stay focused on the task in hand and watch as God prevails. Okay, so let me tell you a bit about myself now. Okay, so when I was 11 years old, okay, some know, 
who grew, who grew with me. I had multiple strokes over a short period of time. Yep. So I was a I was a rare stroke victim when I was 11 years old. Each stroke left me with total paralysis down my left hand side. Okay. So the NHS, so the NHS and all my doctors still had me flagged as having a neurological brain condition and. And, uh, and, and they had me flagged as being a high risk person, they had me flagged as being vulnerable and even the last letter I received from, from the NHS was in October 2020, so less than four weeks ago and, and that letter was still calling me, me, me vulnerable. So, but in spite of this, I made a decision more than 20 years ago to focus on what I can do and just wait in God for all the other stuff that he may be doing in me. So listen, I've chosen to focus on my fruits and not my frustrations. And I'm focusing on the fruit that God has given me. And I'm, 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 and, and I'm telling you, I'm going to focus on what God, what God is doing in me. Rather, what, I'm going to wait for what God is doing in me. Then, then rather than, than try and wait for my TD Jake's blessing or my, my Bend It Like Beckham um sports um sports 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 gifted you know I, I haven't got those and you know i might have to wait till i'm 85 but listen what you magnify is what you get more of think about your conversations okay so so since then since i had my stroke when i was 11 years old um like i said i've 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 i've, I've decided to to focus on 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 my fruits and what i have got so so this this little misunderstood boy from willino town okay he, I've been to university, I've been educated with a number of advanced international mathematical and statistical banking certifications. I've worked and I'm currently working in senior consulting positions for many of the biggest banks and financial institutions in the UK and around the world. And I've not just worked in, the, in these banks, but I've completed multiple and high profile regulatory and government projects for a lot of these organisations. I've sat around a number of board meetings and tables in Europe with senior management teams speaking multiple languages. And you know what? Aside from the, my my academics, I've, I've played basketball up and down the country, and I've played many European tournaments. So listen, I've chosen to focus on my fruits and not my frustrations. I'm focusing on what God has given me now. Okay, so Philippians four thir four verse thirteen. Let's focus on another guy who 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 flicked his context. Okay, Philippians four verse thirteen. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. A very, very, very popular, popular scripture. So we need to understand that when Paul wrote this portion of scripture, he was in prison. Well, when Paul wrote the whole of Philippians, he was in prison. But Paul chose to ignore his frustrations at that at that point of time, and 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 his his surroundings weren't pretty. But he chose not to let his his context decide what he was going to focus on. He could have easily written Philippians 4 verse 13 saying, Lord, I'm still here, please help me. But, he, but his, context, his context was Jesus Christ, which, which was what he decided to focus on. Okay, so what is context? Let's, let's get into this a little bit. So when I say work context, I mean like the mental framework of something. So in your head, um, you're, you've got, you've got um, your head is composed of things like beliefs, values, expectations, and also past experiences. Okay, so your context usually determines whether you see something as good or as bad, or something as happy, sad, or even if you see someone as an opportunity, or if you see somebody as a threat. Okay, so why am I talking about context and framework? So, have you ever been in a worship service where either you have singers that may not be singing, that may be singing the wrong words or singing out of tune, or you've got musicians who are playing like they're, they're in different rooms, or the drummer might just even be wearing a hat and that just throws your whole, your whole worship, worship session off. Okay, so listen, do not let that be your context. Um, the actual songs, songs or the lack of music thereof um, are not your context. Let your context be that you have a heart for worship or, or even when the worship, or even when the worship worship teams don't hit those notes, that you still submit your heart to the Most High Lord and the King of Kings. Okay, so what's around you does not have to decide what you do. Okay, what's around you does not have to decide what you do. Your context context does not have to be decisive. So just because there's no one around you shouting Hallelujah, praise the Lord, it does not does not mean 
does not mean that you're not allowed to. Okay, so listen. I strongly believe in worship and that our voices must be heard and that we must not be, be silent. We must voice the songs of the Lord and we, and we can get into Psalms 100 and talk about that. But, you know, that's, that's a scripture for, for an, 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 another time. So, okay, so what, good, what God desires most what God desires most is your innermost treasures of your hearts. Okay, so so if you have a heart, you can worship. That is that is a requirement for worship. Okay, so we're gonna get ready to pray now, and and so and and we, we, we thank we thank all those viewers who who are still with us um, even at this late stage. So Lord, we thank you for this time today that we have had discussing worship music and everything else. We pray for that hunger so we can be more like you, so that we can submit our hearts totally to you, Lord. These are tough times for many, so we pray, Lord, that they will find comfort in your word. We pray you will help us get to that place where we hold nothing back, a place of great sacrifice and a place of great obedience, like your faithful son, Abraham. When the music fades and all is stripped away, we pray our heart for worship will start transcending. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you. We thank you so much. Just to breathe something that's a worth that will bless your heart. Oh, I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you.
you 